Well, it's my, really my fault for not having uh, sent any updated <laughs> information to Phil. Um, this biography that he talked about is actually um, not too ancient, but uh, since then I became the director of the McLuhan program and all of the research on language policies and all of these areas have been put into a neat little box somewhere and uh, I haven't been able to, to look at it, unfortunately, but it is in the background of my mind. Um, as uh, Phil mentioned, I, have, I became the director of the McLuhan program in culture and technology and that completely shifted in a way uh, the way I look at the world because suddenly I was put uh, under an umbrella which is uh, very known internationally speaking and little known in the university where the program is located. So it was a very difficult task to think about what do you do as a director when everybody thinks this is a huge research center with hundreds of students coming every year to study culture and technology when in fact it was very huge uh, internationally speaking and I did discover that when I prepared the celebration for the birth of Marshall McLuhan in 2011. A lot of people came to Toronto, some of you did come and, and give great talks and we're going to be publishing the book resulting from that conference. But in reality the, the center had been um, I would say very quiet at the University of Toronto and that's I think being very nicely said uh, in terms of uh, having graduate students uh, conducting research in the fields that was I would say built by the scholars that you all know under the Toronto School of Communication. So it is a daunting task and this is why this talk today is not only dedicated in trying for me to make sense of media ecology but more about media effects which I think I've heard a lot since uh, last year when I was invited in Fordham and when I came to the MEA last year as well here. And again this morning, I think that the, uh, all the talks that I had the pleasure to listen to is always bringing back the notion of media effects and studying this. And as a linguist, uh, I thought I am not a specialist in this. What I know how to analyze is language uh, and trying to see either from a diachronic or synchronic perspective and you'll see that these actually Words may not mean anything anymore when we are looking at big data, but anyway, I was trained in looking at evolution of language and culture, and I thought to start a strong program at the University of Toronto, I have to understand what media ecology is all about, or media, but particularly media ecology and understand um, how we can build something which is a strong and I can only aim at building something as big as McLuhan. So the whole talk today, uh, which is using the word canonic and canons, is actually to illustrate that I am a dwarf on the shoulders of giants and dwarf figuratively speaking, because I'm very small too. So it's easy for me to be a dwarf and to be standing on shoulders of a lot of people. So my giants until I met McLuhan were more, I would say, uh, in English poetry and then French language, so it would be Shakespeare, Blake, Levi-Strauss, Chomsky, Jacobson, Bart, and McLuhan. So these are the giants for me that I am always going back to to make sense of the world or to explain. And so that's to contextualize the talk today. You'll understand why I'm talking about giants and why I'm on the shoulders of people. The second reason why I am doing this talk, this talk is dedicated actually to graduate students. Um, I have been having so many administrative positions to directorship at York. Actually, I became the director of the Research Center on Language Contacts since the biography that you gave and the directorship at the University of Toronto. And I am more and more trying to tell my graduate students to start becoming irreverent because there is no jobs. I mean, there is no jobs in our university. I am in two universities with 50,000 students and a lot of graduate students. 
and we just had one program reviewed this year and there is no recommendation for 10-year position. So we are just going to be uh, getting uh, contractual positions, which I have nothing against, but I cannot ask my colleagues who have contract jobs to spend as many hours as the others in terms of supervising students. So this talk is really for the students because I find that we are pushed by the political economic system to become very, very specialized in our, um, I guess, investigation of a research field. It doesn't matter if it's in media, linguistics, or economics, or math and physics. And the more expert they become, the less job they're actually getting. So my talk is actually to encourage them to be irreverent. And I know it's very difficult when you have tons of debts on your shoulders, but to try to look at graduate studies and enter graduate studies, if you are going into graduate studies, in a more playful, like irreverency and ludicity. I know it's very difficult, and uh, I think that we should all try to do that for our students, because it is ridiculous. I mean, the, as I was saying to Corey, the administration is building buildings. Like we have more and more buildings on our campuses. They are hiring managers and to make sure that those managers have something to do. They are like asking us to write reports after reports. We are crawling under reports and with two, three directorships, I am just writing reports constantly. So the nice research that I, that I used to do is like long gone, but I'm trying to be positive and I'm trying to be, um, looking at it with a playful way. So I have tried in thinking, let's be on, in terms of the field that I am interested, which is the humanities, literature and linguistics. Let's try to be playful. Let's try to meet the model that the institution is trying to push us to adhere to, which is what they define as scientific. What does scientificity mean? We'll see that uh, it's We'll see what the institutions think that scientificity means, but in terms of when we are looking at canon or process of canonicity, it's far more complex than what the institutions are telling us to follow. So I don't want to tell my graduate students to follow this. I mean, I'll make sure that they can defend their thesis because it's just an exercise, but I want that the six years that they're gonna be in graduate school, they have maybe fun and use that time to maybe try to see uh, the world from a different perspective and, and adhering to what the scientists are doing, using big data, using all of these uh, heavy material and devices, even in the humanities, so that they can actually say, well, I can speak the same language as you. I've been there, but on top of that, I have actually something that you don't have, which is creativity, poetry, and all of these things that I guess in this room, everybody is really in favor of, or music, I mean, or performance, and all of these elements. So canonic text in media ecology and plug. I mean, you always come up with those titles. You just don't know, actually. I can't remember where I was when I came up with that title, and I thought, you're going to have now to stick to it. Well, I'll try as much as possible to stick to it. What I meant is that I'm so mad at my administration, and I want the graduate students to make sense of science, regardless of the field, even in French studies or in, in drama studies, that uh, I'm going to try to figure out what are the canonic texts in the field that I will call information and communication, because it is maybe an interesting field to look at because we are right now overloaded with information. We're going to have to make sense of it. And it is uh, under that umbrella that we can put other disciplines, such as media studies, uh, communication. And it is a field that we need to make sense of because, in a way, um, everybody says we are an information society. We read McLuhan with PhD students this year who are doing a PhD in information. And at the end of the reading of one term, which is a first at the University of Toronto of doing this with students in information studies, the student said, well, we actually have no idea what information is. So they're getting a PhD <coughs> in information. And they said, well, what we would like to do next year after having read McLuhan, which is very obscure for them. I mean, they said, we would like to do a lecture series to make sense of what information means and inviting all of these scholars 
who have published books and theories or, or theorizing the field of information and asked them to do what McLuhan did, which is to put their theory through the prism of culture and technology. We don't know yet if all of these scholars are going to come because it, in a way, testing them to revise the way they are talking about information. And we don't want them to come and discuss information the way they have theorized it. We want them actually to be able to say, this is what I have developed as a theory, but now I'm going to try to, with you, take it and look at it through the prism of culture and technology. So everything that I have been saying until now is that, yes, there is now an academic program at the University of Toronto, which is called Culture and Technology and not Communication or Media Studies. And the reason why we uh, launched such an academic program is because this is what McLuhan actually said in his archives when he was writing to the president of the university. I don't want the center to be the center for communication. I don't want the center to be named media. I want the center to be called culture and technology. And this year in October is the 50th anniversary of the opening of this center. So it's a big challenge because nobody knows what culture and technology means. And imagining giving a diploma, a master, or a PhD in culture and technology is a big challenge in a way. So this is why this study is all about, like, let's try to make sense of canonic process of canonicity for authors or for text. And uh, I'm sure you have seen already the list that Lance has put on the Media Ecology Association. So everybody decides who are the canonic text. So for the Media Ecology Association, if I was to choose an example, these are the canonic text decided by, I guess, a group of scholars. That helped me a lot. That's a good start for me to understand what media ecology is all about. What else can I do? I have to listen and try to be as aggressive as the administrators in my university or some of my colleagues thinking that uh, canonicity means scientificity or authority. And how do they define scientificity and authority in disciplines such as sociology, anthropology, is by looking at the models that have been implemented in physics, and in the hard science, and it is usually based on, I'm sure you know that because you are all academics, it's based, if you look, and I will show you. So that was the list given by the MEA. It's usually circulation, bibliometrics, um, how many times scholars are cited, how many times uh, there have been book reviews about yourself? Uh, I guess judgment by peers. These are the criteria that you are all familiar with. Now, it is one way. And I did, um, to start my investigation in media ecology, what I did is that I uh, got the help of librarian from these two, uni two libraries, I mean, university libraries, York and U of T, and I'm going to extend that search uh, further to North America at some point to figure out what were the books which circulates the most in libraries. And some of you will be surprised. I was surprised myself. I'm not going to show you the Excel um, sheet, but the book that circulates the most in these two big libraries, I mean, these are huge universities, is No Sense of Place, Joshua Meyerowitz. That was a surprise for me. Why Joshua's book is number one? Why is it the book that is circulating the most? So that was the beginning of my inquiry. Like, what is it with this text? Uh, because, you know, in, in, you, do, you all do that, you put those canonic texts in your bibliographies, or you, so this is why the books circulate in libraries, like they're not in your, in your courses, but they are referred in your syllabi, and therefore the students who are curious are getting the books from the library. So why Joshua Meyerowitz's books is number one? And of course McLuhan is there. 
So that's actually when you see this um, graph here is University of Toronto. So this is actually out of 271. And what you can, and then you have University of York. There was a little bit more borrowed in that field because I guess York having a big communication department compared to U of T, uh, there is more circulation of books in that area. But what is interesting for me is that if, you, if let's, let's consider or let's assume that that's one way of defining canonicity is circulation. We will see it's, it's more complex than that. But let's say that it is uh, the library circulation as a start for me to choose my corpus that I will plug into big data. It was for me interesting in figuring out that actually 2% of the books which are the most borrowed um, are actually the one circulating to the rate of 80%. So you have actually 1.5 books circulating 80% in terms of the ratio. And then after 200, my statistics were, which I thought were incredible, is that um, after 276 of that list, the books are not borrowed anymore. So they were purchased by the library. And you know how we purchase books. Like you start, so a new tenure guy arrives, he gives a list of the library, we purchase the books, but these books do not circulate. And so that was for me the beginning of my investigation. This is, I would say, an institutional way of looking at it. We're gonna be looking as well at the underground, the counterculture, like the books which are circulated illegally in a digital format, because this is as informing as uh, I would say more institutional way of looking at circulation of knowledge. Um, so this is what we are trying to do is a game, is a game in trying to figure out if we shift. So you can shift, as you can see, it's going to be animated, but I was trying to look at it as you know, like those kaleidoscope, <laughs> and you change things and try to figure out like what is actually. Uh, uh, so you have, I would say, three poles, and there is a, a mistake here. It's not territoriality, but it, it was technology. So there is power, the power, the institutional power, or the counterculture power when things are actually happening in uh, not an institutional way. There is the genealogy, like what affiliation those uh, books or authors are referring to. And all of this is to make sense of media ecology, is to figure out uh, how can I choose a corpus? You know, like as a linguist, we need data. So how will I be as possibly, as pos I mean, the, the best way for me to be objective? Again, I said I am standing on the shoulder of giants. Now I want to be standing on the shoulder of the machine because I'll be using big data, but I still want to make sense of uh, what is media ecology and could we borrow the media ecology paradigm to actually figure out what, if there is an evolution in canonicity for the print world, but as well for the digitized world which is coming. So everything that we know on that will is actually based on the print world. Uh, we know, for example, uh, we calculate, uh, we formalize, we mediate, we disseminate, we compute those numbers to make sense of like what is canonic and what is not canonic. Uh, sometimes books are affected, their circulation is affected because the research was funded. So we're trying to get all of these um, criteria into the game to make sure that we are covering as, as much as possible in terms of what would be a canonic text. Not because it is, as we saw, in the list, in the syllabi, or because it is circulating in library, or because it is the most cited text. But what defined the process of canonicity? And why are these texts standing generation after generation? Like as a linguist, I was, I was thinking like, what, what is it in Joshua Zmirovitz's book that made him number one? Like there must be something that I am not seeing by doing a close reading of his book. Because, I mean, I read his book, I like Joshua's book, but it didn't for me, uh, it's not a Shakespeare, for example, okay? So it's, <laughs> I like it, it's very, it's very interesting, very informative, but I wasn't sure it would stand time, but the circulation is 1983 to 2010. 
So that's a long period to be number one after that period. So what is it in this book? Um, so this is, as you can see, we're going to be playing. And this will, I call it the canonicity will, uh, is actually for me my reference point so that I can see the affiliation, like the affiliation in the, these books with different disciplines to see if scientificity is uh, when it's borrowed from other disciplines such as mathematics and physics and life science into the disciplines such as sociology and humanities and we're trying our best to borrow these uh, frame, framework, uh, are we making a mistake in saying yes to the trend which is pushing us to define scientificity under these criteria? So I have lots of questions uh, regarding this. So I borrowed the on the shoulders of giant metaphor, which I'm sure you have read Merton's book, uh, Eliu Katz, who is talking about the different schools in media. So it was just for me to get information. That's a close reading though. I'm reading those books. I'm doing what I have always been trained to do in actually following what I would call a argumentative rhetoric. And then there is the style, like you look at the style, the genre, like the way the person is writing. But will I be able to do that if I plug all of these 100 texts that are going to be the one that stand the test of that canonicity will? I'll have, I hope, 100 texts, which will not be the one that circulated in library. It could be something which is completely illegal circulating into another type of network. When I put those 100 texts into my big data um, will this time, uh, will I be able to see what Elihu Katz saw, like in terms of ideas generated by schools, School of Chicago, School of Toronto, School of Birmingham? Uh, I know I won't, because the uh, distance reading that big data is imposing is not going to allow me, unfortunately, to go for that com comfortable zone that we are all uh, too familiar with, which is close readings. And this is how we have been conducting uh, our approval or disapproval of text or, or authors. And we are all, in a way, uh, coupable of when we make that choice on our syllabi in perpetuating, uh, I guess, citation. So I think Corey uh, mentioned today something, something which I really enjoyed was the speaking, the speech speaking and speech spoken. And uh, I thought it was actually a great way of uh, formulating this is what my investigation is all about. We have become speech spoken. We are only speaking about, but are we really like in a way McLuhan was doing speaking and proposing ideas as we speak, as a linguist, like it's in terms of temporality, we are actually proposing uh, new ideas ourselves instead of standing on the shoulders of giants to become, uh, I guess, someone that we hope will be cited and that uh, we will make it to that, um, I guess, bar that the institutions are asking us to be like cited so many times so that you can go from associate professor to professor and all of these loops that they are making us jump through. Um, so, exploring canonicity in medium theory. Uh, for today, the only thing that I have from the beginning, because we're not finished with the gathering of those 100 texts that we hope will be, in a way, somehow uh, close to what we hope uh, be defined by canonicity the way we would like it to be. And uh, so what we did is, I'm going to show you, decided to trope, just to explain to you the questions that uh, this investigation is raising. So I have the external analysis. You're not going to be able to see, but that's not the point. It actually, it's better that you don't see. Uh, <laughs> because I want you to just see shapes. I don't want you to see words. Um, what is important is, um, because we're, we're moving with big data and visualization, 
And I am questioning actually that tendency, but that gives us the impression that we're being scientific by, uh, as in the humanities, to actually, you know, you have heard that word, digital humanities, we're crunching numbers, we're becoming scientific. So I thought, well, let's try. Let's try with Joshua Meyerowitz's book, which is number one on the circulation list, and let's try understanding media, uh, who we all know here is one of our favorite canonic texts. So what did I do? I, um, with tropes, which is a program, but there are so many of them. What you're trying to define are words or semantic fields. And uh, so we're talking about media effects this morning. So what do I see? I see words like affect, undermine, and then I see on the left or on the right what uh, this uh, author is talking. So for example, uh, for affect in uh, no sense of place, uh, Myrovitz says electronic media affect us, or which electronic media affects the information system. I mean, I can do lots of studies like that, but, and I'll have to come up with a rhetoric to make sense of it. But what is interesting with these um, new way of looking at text is that I cannot do a close reading and I am forced to forget about the story that these authors are saying. I'm just looking at words and associations. And I guess people in general semantics should be happy. I am forced to only see associations. Now, what am I going to do with those associations? Uh, given the, the, the semantic richness of language, um, I think that by isolating those fields, can, by tracking, I guess, the behavior of words, and I'm using behavior because we are thinking that the machine is actually giving us a kind of a behavioral uh, solution here, by tracking the frequency behaviors of semantic fields, much wider yet meaningful related to groups of words, uh, it may have the potential of, I guess, shifting my reading, and it's just a different reading of the text. And this is what I have found, is that um, there is frequency behaviors, and uh, I could show you, I guess I have an example that I wanted to show you, if I can find projected documents. Where is my... Um, So I heard this morning in some talks that media ecology is associated with psychology. Uh, you can see that actually with that document that I did, which is a comparative study of understanding media and no sense of place, it doesn't matter if you don't read the, the, uh, the text again. What I am looking is, for example, genealogy with human science. The, the machine is gonna actually spit to me an interesting thing, for no science, for no sense of place, I can see the relationship with the different discipline that uh, the text refers to. So I can see where is the influence for Meyerowitz in terms of his framework. What is interesting for me when I compare understanding media and no sense of place is not really the discipline that um, they are, it's, I'm trying to look at it and trying to change my reading of it. And this is for the graduate students coming. Because what big data is forcing you is not to look again at an argumentation. It's forcing you to look at high density, low density, saturation, proximity, distance in terms of objects. And that's a different way of reading. So this is for Joshua Meyerowitz, the distance between the human science and these and cognition, for example, and you'll see that for McLuhan, it's far more, it's further. That's for, no, the next one is with biology. Look at the way those little bubbles are organized on the, uh, that's for McLuhan. With science and technology, that's Joshua. That's McLuhan. So 
So just giving you a few examples. So what do I do with that? That's interesting. I can, I can see proximity. I can see distance with, uh, I guess, a uh, conceptual framework that those scholars borrowed from to make sense of uh, what they have to say about media effects. But at the end of my study, uh, I am left with questions like, how can I describe the collective behavior of this group of words? And I'm using words like collective and individuals in terms of trying to human, to get that machine more human. We were talking this morning with uh, the telepresence that we are becoming machine. Well, by doing this, I feel that I am actually even more a machine, but in a way, machine is, is spitting lots of data to me, and I can decide to make sense of it as I have always done with print. So same type of analysis, and what I have to do is uh, doing what we do in semantic, trying to group them and give an analysis to give a story. Now, how that would be novel, it's just transferring what we know, translating, transferring what we know from print into the digital world. How novel is this if I don't change my reading of things? So how can I ensure that, uh, for example, my view is uh, representative of the parts? Um, I think that even looking at semantic fields, and what these uh, big data is telling me is not going to really help me uh, make sense of the associations that are being spit out of the machine. And the only thing that actually was very interesting for me, and I'll, I'll move to something else after, but as a linguist, what these machine has allowed me to do, which was impossible to do manually, was actually to Coalis, diachrony, and synchrony. And you know that for linguists, this is really big. Like, we're always looking at evolution through times of language or culture and the evolution of the system in a synchronic way. Now, the machine doesn't make the distinction if the author is talking about the evolution in a diachronic perspective or in a synchronic perspective. So that was a very interesting for me uh, um, discovery, is that the machine actually flattens the diachronic and synchronic dichotomy that we have always used in looking at evolution. So that's the first question I have for you in terms of media ecology. What are we going to do when we look at media effects if there is a coal coalescence of those two notions, diachrony and synchrony? They are gone. How are we going to look at analyzing media effects on society? Um, when we don't have any more of these type of, um, I guess, references. The generated fields mythology plugged into the do media effects, do media have effects system? I have to question that. I know we talked a lot about that this morning. It seems like the three speakers agreed that telepresence had effects on our collective, private behavior. I mean, it was made uh, clear. Now, if I want to actually look at that same question through the big data, I'm going to have to uh, plug different labels uh, to make sense of what was discussed this morning in telepresence, because otherwise I'm just going to be stuck with the same proximity distance between words and semantic fields, and that doesn't really give me a new way of uh, making sense of it. So what maybe we could be looking at if we are uh, thinking of using the media, I mean, I'm trying to use a media ecology paradigm to make sense of um, what else should we do uh, with our graduate students in an academic program called Culture and Technology. We have to train our students not only to use it, look at big data, borrow the, uh, I guess, conceptual framework that science is uh, enforcing on us, but I want them to have an advantage. And what is this advantage? Is that if media ecology is what you are all talking about, and I heard that this morning with uh, the session where Phil was, for example, regarding uh, music, like my question is, big data is good. It's giving me a more objective way of looking at the text. It's forcing me to do a distance reading instead of a close reading. 
and trying to develop a grammar with elements that I can call linguistics, but they are not linguistic in terms of uh, phonology, morphology, and syntax, but they are, I guess, new ways of trying to find patterns. And this is where McLuhan is very important. How do I define those patterns in when I'm reading those graphs, those trees, those arborescence, which is not based on the vocabulary of the grammar that I've always used with print? So this is the big question for me. Like, How do we invent a new grammar when the linguistic elements are different type of, I would say, arborescence or trees? How do I make sense of those words, semantically speaking? And I guess there are some scholars who have uh, been looking at that, particularly uh, Franco Moretti, who is looking at, at literature and doing, uh, and that's why I am looking at literature because it is diff more, more difficult to actually come up with, uh, with labels for these semantic groups in a discipline like literature where, where there is creativity and poetry uh, more than, for example, scientific uh, discourse. And um, what he came up with, of course, he saw that for a hundred years, so he was, he was looking at the mystery novel and trying to actually define how, how the canonic text, which, and of course it's Conan Doyle, but what makes um, this author, a canonic, over a hundred years of text produced in that area. And it forced him to, I guess, reinvent, to give labels to those, uh, I guess, uh, way of looking at frequency, low frequency, high frequency, saturation, uh, proximity, distance, which is rendered by those visualization. And they come up, for example, with concepts such as social restraint, moral valuation, uh, par partiality, and I guess a new reading of those uh, literature books. And we can do that. Uh, I'm willing to, to, to try the test to come up and figure out what is the canonicity evolution paradigm by looking at the media ecology canonic text. But I am convinced that I'm not going to get an answer. Uh, what I may discover is what Chomsky calls, and he makes the, dis the difference between problems and mystery. I think that all of these big data, uh, what, is gonna, what it's going to do to me or to the students that are willing to adopt that scientific approach, is that it's going to give them, uh, I guess, the um, possibility of saying that they are not subjective, like this is objectivity, even by looking at fields which are more uh, in the humanities and not those hard science. But what is important is that, as Chomsky says regarding his research, he has just solved a problem. So the problem is, how can we in media ecology or in humanities or in sociology invent new semantic fields to describe what scientificity is, which would be true to us and not borrowed from other fields. But what we haven't uh, figured out, even with those big data uh, uh, engines, is mystery. And Chomsky makes the distinction between solving problems and solving a mystery. And I am convinced that even with that big data crunch that I'm going to do with those canonic texts, I may find a way of defining scientificity in areas which are, as, as I call them, uh, the humanities, sociology, communication, but I don't think that I'll be able to break the code of the mystery about why some uh, text, even in the field of science, are canonic and some others are not. And um, even if mystery is something that goes back to antiquity, I don't think we have actually understood what is this mystery in, in some text compared, or some authors like McLuhan who stands the time. And maybe it's better like that. So that's what I would like uh, to end up my uh, talk. I did uh, find a few interesting, uh, as I said, a few interesting new way of looking at text. It was a convergence of diachronicity and synchronicity 
when analyzing uh, word semantic fields. Uh, and I guess what I have discovered as well, and that was confirmed by the talk this morning in the panel about uh, music, is that what these uh, big data projects, what they need to do is in a way to bring back the uh, oral space into the visual, uh, and it, which means bringing back the emotion. And I don't know how to do it, but I suspect that students who have been in video gaming or have been used at looking at screens all the time and can actually read as we listen. So that would be maybe the, the way of going, is actually listening to data and not reading data. And maybe that's a way we can bring back the emotion into those big uh, machines which are just crushing text, uh, which are very useful. I'm not against technology. I think that uh, it's great that we have machine crushing text like that, and then I can spend my time doing something else, which is more trying to come up with a way of bringing those semantic association. But uh, and I, I would have never dreamt about doing it over a century or 50 years. So I'm glad that technology can do that for me. But the technology is just an engine. And when, when I was asked today, uh, do you, are you optimistic or, or pessimistic regarding technology? I said, as a linguist, we don't see evolution sometimes over like 200 years. So I don't think we should panic. But um, as I said, I think that we do bring need to bring back the emotion into the reading of these big data and uh, to make sense of the effects of media, which is, I guess, uh, what media ecology is all about. Thank you. There is actually an international uh, funding, which is called Big Data, which uh, is already uh, putting together European uh, uh, scholars from Asia and from North America. It's called Big Data, and they're always looking. So it's true. Uh, my, the purpose why I answered back to Corey and Lance when they asked me to come here, it was not to be a professor giving a lecture. It was more actually to stimulate scholars in this room <coughs> to, as you say, get together and try to work on projects like that to make sense of media ecology. Because I do think that media ecology, like I have been working on language ecology, is, is very important uh, to make sense of how ideas uh, transcend time and space. Because, I mean, one, for example, of canonicity is, of course, translation. Uh, when a work is being translated in many, so there is, we can, we can look at geolocation as well to make sense of uh, like the authority 
of a text or, or a person. So there are more and more uh, funding for this big data, but you need big team. And for me, it seems like you are already quite a nice group to, uh, to try to, to do this. And you already know far better than me uh, those texts, which means that you would be the shoulder, uh, of the, like you would be standing on the machine, on the shoulder of the machine to try to come up with those uh, semantic fills that would make sense in trying and figure out like when did the shifts happen in those uh, texts or in those offers? Like what was new that they actually came up with? Because you already have that experience of a very close reading with text and print. So that's why uh, I am really encouraging you to, to, to get into this and not be afraid because I mean, the machine does it, the software does it, but we still need the critical thinking and the expertise and the knowledge of these, how many hours you spent in trying to make sense of those texts to actually come up with those labeling and impress them. Because if we can actually demonstrate, this is actually maybe the future of media ecology. You are very well positioned to show the evolution of, for example, that notion of authority or scientificity. And that we shouldn't allow ourselves to believe that we have to conform to that label that is given by the hard science. Uh, but we have to mobilize ourselves. Until we don't speak the same language as them, then we are nobody. Yep. So if, if we're going to use those kinds of methods, you need to have people that understand what kinds of assumptions are built in at the level of code, at the algorithms, which are yep. already where media is being made. And I fully agree with you, and this is why I think that your group, which has been studying media effects, is very well positioned to do this. Because uh, I agree, right now those softwares are programmed by people who uh, sometimes are collaborating. Uh, I mean, it could be engineer, I mean, collaborating with uh, people in, li in literature or in linguistics. I mean, the Franco Moretti, Moretti project it really illustrates that. It's someone in literature working with designers. But there are flaws in the machine because their presumption, as you mentioned, from the beginning sometimes are just anchored in the representation of the scholars developing the program. So you need to have people like you looking, for example, I know that one of the projects regarding literature was uh, criticizing the way the taxonomies were proposed because it was something developed for a particular case and not translatable or transferable to another, uh, to another field. So this is the critical uh, reading that I, you are pointing to and which is very crucial so that uh, the machine becomes more intelligent, but not because I want the machine to do the analysis. Uh, I want the, the, the machine to actually crush the data in a, an intelligent way. And we're just at the beginning and there's lots of flaws right now, even when you're looking at the way they are organizing uh, the categories. being flooded with having to write reports. And I, I had to be the coordinator of my major when we had to do our strategic plan and our assessment plan and all these kinds of, of things. Um, and they're exhausting. So I, I have some practice in trying to make that as fast and as useful to us for a process as possible without wasting people's time too much. And to try to be creative with it. And I was looking at the little thing that you had with the little planets on it, the little balls. And I was thinking, now here's something that you you can sort of mm -hmm. return time to the thing by, instead of studying individual books, 
we could talk about like which books were most popular across time. You know, when did Gutenberg Galaxy become most read? When did it kind of fade out? When did you know the notion of play, uh, place come and go? And then it's like kind of do the top five, do the little uh, manipulation that they want, come up with the little planets, and then do a flip book out of it and see how the planets are moving and whether they're getting bigger or smaller. Because like there was a big women there and it, there wasn't the women in the other one. And I thought, oh, that must have been the feminist movement or that must have been, you know, women's rights or whatever. And you know, then there was one that I saw aloneness or something, emptiness. Yep. And, and, and so what you could do is sort of track the planetary movement, see what's getting bigger and smaller, and then you might be able to anticipate what the next popular book would be based on which, you know, maybe emptiness has been the next one that's really focusing on emptiness will do, or, you know, like fractals. You're not trying to prognosticate way into the future, but you can see trends and you can see what things are getting bigger and smaller across time. And that would take lots of grad students and it would take lots of faculty. And then, you know, you have everybody, everybody would have to read all of these books and compile all of these ideas and say, what are the, you know, the themes that are really big across time that come and, and are they connected to um, political change? Are they connected to uh, other kinds of movements in culture? So that, that, that it does. I mean, it's, it's very easy. You, you see it emerging. But I don't think it's enough. But I think for what you were saying in terms of the administration projecting or uh, trying to, I guess, educate uh, graduate students to be on the tip and not being uh, below so that they are being hired, definitely that's a creative strategy. Actually, I have that criteria in the canonicity will, the, the sales on Amazon. Well, I think it's going to change our definition of science. And it I'm is. Not sure, I'm not sure who's I'm, I'm tapping here. It might be Francis Bacon who said science is really about explanation, prediction, and control. The explanation part is going to drop out of it. We're not really going to be that worried about explaining things as much. Our understanding, maybe that sometimes comes understanding, prediction, and control. But prediction and control becomes very, very important here with big data. And I wonder, you know, or who's controlled and, and all of that uh, might be the, the concern, whether it's 200 years or well, right, right now, I think that actually the uh, the people running even our universities are going to make use of big data. And if we don't have uh, this, if we're not using the same tool to actually respond, then uh, they're going to win because they're going to come up with all of these uh, analysis from big data, like looking at trends for tenure, like all of these things. Uh, and if we can't actually prove to them that uh, there is there is a different way of analyzing the data, like if you are just plugging the way that we have been analyzing text by a close reading, then we're just repeating history. But I suspect that uh, if we try to trick ourselves to not come up with the same type of analysis of these, uh, I guess, type of uh, association that the big data is showing, this is our chance to actually, as academic, say, well, we can use big data as well, but to actually uh, come up with a different strategy to uh, decide what science is and the way the university should be going. But right now, we are like so paralyzed because of the intensity, like we have to do service, research, teaching, and they are not really renewing our tenure position that in a way they are like very comfortable in making more progress by uh, using big data for their message. And we don't have a counter, uh, ex I guess, example to, to give them saying, well, we can use big data and actually show you that uh, you, it, it's your interpretation and we can come up with another interpretation. I think you're hopeful that we might be able to all come together and you know, sort of 
I do. I do actually. I do really hope that's actually why I came here. I think that you do. You have uh, such a good uh, grounding in what media ecology means, and I don't. But that I do think that you should really uh, get together and, and and tackle this because you are the right scholar. I mean, I was hearing this morning in, again in the same session. Well, we are like not really uh, capable of influencing. Uh, our institution, uh, media ecology is not really considered as a big uh, player. Well, you can change that. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, make you listen, and I, thought, I think that Phil, you're going you're gonna to laugh about that. But uh, I believe it is this extract. We have someone at the CBC in Toronto who you know, is a. I've created hundreds of ads, directed a few thousand commercials, and been in hundreds of high-level presentations. This much I know. One of the biggest lessons I've learned is that marketing is theater. In a marketplace where people are exposed to over 3,000 advertising messages a day, only the spectacular ideas break through. I have seen, time and again, how ideas need to be fearless and need to be wrapped up in the most surprising packages possible. So what I am playing here is saying, you are a small group, and the institutions or universities are using the tools of the marketing and the advertising. But you know how marketing and publicity is actually made. So you have an advantage over them. Why don't we transform our message by using, I mean, this is Stereo Rally. It's his show or, uh, called Under the Influence, and it was actually a show uh, given on Saturday where he's giving six criteria about what is successful. We can market and, and, and do what he's talking about, not for a product, but for knowledge. Like, we know the tricks. We know how to do it. This is the field where you actually study it. But we are incapable of using those tools to actually promote what we call science and why looking at media effects uh, and the ecology of media effects, why uh, this is important to look at it to define scientificity. Yes? I'm not sure I am. So, you, you, did you say that I'm trying to uh, convince you to wear a mask? No. <laughs> Which I don't mind. Okay, uh, let's break that part. Uh, my question quickly is, uh, you've been here for a couple of days. Uh, has hanging out with this group changed your vision for the center somehow? It has, but it, as I said, it was actually last year when I came in New York, that I realized that you are the group, I, I'm convinced you are the group that can really come up with the, um, how would I say, the criteria to define scientificity. Because scientificity, come, as you see on my wheel, it takes into account authority, it takes into account marketing, it takes into account all of these notions of production, uh, reproduction, mediation, you know this by heart. But the model that has been imposed by onto us, which is the model of the heart science or the life science, and uh, the political economy as well in terms of efficiency, calculation, like we are calculating, measuring, this is not something that is what you do in media ecology or by studying media. You don't calculate. Or do you? Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think you do. You have another model, you have another framework, which is not the dominant one. 
but it is E1 that corresponds to, as I said, what Asterio rarely says. Like, and the next, actually, the next uh, one is actually even better for you. I have also come to believe that small brands need a big personality. A small company can compete with large budgets. You are a small brand, but you have big personalities as canonic authors above you. You're a small brand, but you have the big, the big guys uh, in a way regarding your field. So how do you use this? You can. You know the tricks. You're the best one to know the tricks, how to do it. A linguist is not going to be able to do it. People in literature are not going to be able to do it. People in biology are not going to be able to do it. They don't know how to market and publicize. They don't know how to play with language to communicate. They don't know, we, I mean, in literature we study poetry, and we don't know how to use poetry to actually change the world. You do. Nice. Well, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. But of course. I'm going to sort of take a, a different tack on this, and you use the term canonical, and, and you mentioned Elihu Katz, who is no friend of media ecology or, or McLuhan, but you did that book with you know, using those convenient yes. fictions of the Toronto School, the Frank Chicago, School, yeah, yeah. the Chicago School. But can't, you know, the idea of canonizing something is goes back to religious discourse. And, and I just wonder if this method had been employed back by the rabbis when they were canonizing the Hebrew Bible, what the hell would have made it into, you know, in, into that collection? Probably a lot of really weird stuff from, from all over the place. And, uh, you know, the same with the Church Fathers for, for the New Testament. Uh, and, and what was considered canonical text, say, in media ecology, I mean, a lot of it goes back to McLuhan's bibliography. You know, that was a real starting place. Even James Carey, who was a, a often very critical of McLuhan, said that, that if nothing else, that was one of the great redeeming uh, parts of, of understanding media was the bibliography, to go back and look at those. And so many of the texts that we would consider canonical were texts that were kind of rejected or, or not well thought of in their field. Like Havelock was not well thought of in classics, but, pre but you know, preface to Plato is a canonical uh, text for us. And Innes was certainly not well received in, in uh, economics, but uh, you know, for us that his text was important. So, uh, you know, in, in some ways, it, the, the pop, it's almost like a reversal because the idea of the canon, canonical texts are popular because someone with some insight selected them out and said, these are the texts you should read, um, where this is almost turning it around and saying, let's select the texts we should read based on uh, whoever, what, what text people are reading, which is a kind of tautology rather than an exercise of, of human judgment. But what do you mean by people, texts that people are reading? Well, when you go, it's like the popularity. Okay. So, you know, what are the, and we don't really know that they're reading it, but you know, what are the texts they're checking out of the library? What, who's buying them on Amazon? And, yeah. um, just like the citation index is, um, is not necessarily a, a criterion yeah. of, of quality of something, it's just who are people going to cite, which is often a political mode, and if i got to cite the big people in my field. Exactly. And you know, the people who work at PhD granting institutions and have doctoral students who cite them, and, as opposed to those who don't. You know, that there, there are many other factors that, that work into this that are different from someone uh, selecting out and saying, this is what's worth reading, this is what's worth noting, knowing, as, as Neil Postman used to say to us when we were students, this will make you smarter. Well, this is why I said, like, I mean, we have to look at what is institutionally acceptable and accepted and completely uh, used in terms, because it has to be part of the ingredients in terms of uh, making sense. But we have to add, uh, as I said, Amazon or microblogging, but these are more conversation. But we have to find a way of putting all of these factors into the, uh, the pot so that uh, what is left in terms of defining if we have 
don't even start with a hundred texts which may not be the most cited text or the most the book which circulates the most. I think what is interesting is like what defines those 100 texts. Uh, not because I want to see the genre or like the, uh, the at the discourse level. They, they, I think it's more to figure out if these books have stand time, not because they were pushed by institution, but even by the counterculture, like the underground, then there is something, and it's not at the discourse level, I think it's in the, at the idea level that is interesting. Maybe these people knew, as Terry O'Reilly says, they knew how to stage their ideas, they knew how to use silence to actually make the other part of their message more preeminent. I mean, there may be trick in those texts, but what is important for us is to see why are these ideas. Uh, and that's why I make the distinction between canons and canonicity. I think I'm more interested in finding out what, are the, what is canonicity and the evolution of that word and try to say uh, it has been linked with scientificity or authority, as you said. And this morning I thought I'd just note down when Doug Rushkoff was saying, we are on the podium. I mean, it was so like his old talk, like we are up there, you are on there, the words are coming, like we are special. He was just actually playing with that metaphor of the giant, but then he says, I am actually middle range. So it's interesting to see that people are actually ranking themselves. Uh, even when they spontaneously speak, I thought it was quite interesting for my talk this afternoon. We all do ranking, but they, there are some criteria, some uh, ideas formulated in those texts that we consider as uh, canonic. And what I mean by canonic, it's because they stand time and in it, and I guess philosophers here maybe, uh, there are some truth in those texts that transcend times and space. And how do we define that in terms of uh, media ecology? I think it would be great for you to actually identify what is truth and what are the values uh, that defines media ecology. And that transcends times and space. And once you have that, I think it's better than those scientific methods in terms of calculation and computation. I, uh, within the canon of media ecology, such as it is, there are, there are two books written by the same author, and one of them is teaching as a subversive activity, and the other is teaching as a conserving activity. And so from my point of view, the, <coughs> excuse me, the positioning of media ecology in a greater system is to help pull the system in the direction that best serves, I suppose, learning or humanity, um, however you like to look at it. And from my point of view, it's the sort of technocratic approach that the system has taken in education that is broken, and to try and speak the language of the technocrat in order to produce some sort of radical change is perhaps not the subversive value That's that true. ecology poses from outside the system, which speaks to me in terms of the idea of us as a small brand. Because I think if media ecology is a brand at all, it would deserve to die if it didn't do the mission of the subversive work and then, in fact, I think it transcends brand altogether because if we count from among the people who influence us, Heraclitus, all the way up through Rushkoff, Rushkoff and, and our contemporaries, that whatever form media ecology takes in either conserving or being subversive to the greater system is the role that we have to play. And so I'm not sure necessarily that, um, that the role of this group is or, or the kind of work that we do is necessarily to fix them save them from themselves by doing what they do right, on their own behalf. Well, as I said at the beginning of my talk, I'm doing it for the graduate students. <laughs> I, I, I understand as well as anyone. Because I find that, I mean, they have to be helped. I mean, it's not fair what's happening to them. Uh, I, I do want to develop creativity. So actually, to finish the talk, if you still have two seconds, I'll give you the last piece by Terry O'Reilly, which I think is a great message. And I think that what maybe you should identify in media ecology is what he calls that consistency in creativity. Creativity is not an exercise in consistency. Good advertising is more like a shish kebab. It should be a string of surprising treats, a 
a tomato, a green pepper, a mushroom, all skewered by a consistent strategy. Each ad should be surprising and different, but the entire campaign is held together by a consistent communication strategy. Nike is a great example of this. No two commercials look alike, but they are all anchored by Nike's attitude, which never, ever changes. I am not a role model. I'm not paid to be a role model. I'm paid to wreak havoc on the basketball court. Parents should be role models. Oh, just because I dunk for basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. So that actually ends. <laughs> That actually answers your message. You don't have to teach the kids being the administrators, but you can be the role model. Thank you. I was fascinated by the notion of language ecology. McQuillan said a new technology, a new medium, never leaves the older medium alone. It jostles them, it changes yeah. them. So could you give us an example of how language ecology works? Media ecology was a new term. How did it change things? Well, I think that actually language ecology is uh, really being studied through the notion of the theory of contact. So when systems are actually in contact, you borrow for a while, and I think you can actually apply that to media. So instead, and I think that's what McLuhan says, like, I mean, his laws of media actually really illustrate that theory of contact. Like, you borrow for a while, you, I would say, adapt it to your system, like the way you think and you see the world, and then at some point, because of so societal uh, pressure or political or for whatever reason, then you drop that moment, which is actually great, where you have, in a way, a kind of all of these system trying to make sense together. And uh, at some point, unfortunately, uh, we drop that multilingualism and we become monolingualism, even with media. And we are facing a time right now, which is actually the great time, because we are at that transition period between the print age and the digital age. So we are really observing that contact between those two systems. It's not going to last. I mean, observation from language ecology. That period lasts for quite a while, but it disappears after a while. And then one system becomes the most uh, monolithic and imposes it itself. So this is why it's very important that we do it now, because um, we are still in that hybrid moment where we have no problem borrowing from one system to another. I mean, when I see the publication online today, there is no difference between publishing it into a print book or putting it on the website. The only thing you are adding is the interaction with the ideas, but it is not that taking advantage of the digital to actually come up with new way of presenting your ideas. It's just the same text. It's just that you can query it with big data. You can interact with it. You can create conversation around it. And I am in favor of that. But that's not really where I'm sure in uh, 50 years uh, we will be. Um, because this is what language ecology has taught me. At some point, unfortunately, one system becomes dominant. And you see that in bilingual, in trilingual people, multilingual. But what we figured out, actually, uh, there is a, and I'm sure, Phil, you have heard that uh, with um, the Professor Bialystok at uh, Glendon. They have actually realized, and that could be maybe a metaphor that we could use, um, that to prevent Alzheimer, the more you are speaking languages, the more you are actually connecting the neurons in your brains, then you are pushing that moment where uh, your brain is not uh, thinking and stimulating different areas. Now, we are right now in that moment where we are stimulated digitally and printly, if I can use those words. It's not going to last. We're not going to stay bilingual like that forever. Unfortunately, at some point, we will become digital. And I'm not the first one to say that. Paul Levinson wrote a book a long time about it, about being digital. The whole conversation around those sessions is that we are becoming digital. I am asked, are you thinking that it is a negative or a positive thing? 
No, because language ecology has shown me that you just shift from one system to another, but you are still human. So that's why I'm, I was asked earlier, I am positive, I'm not negative, but not because I believe in technologies, just because we will remain human anyway, going through different orality, the, re the print, the digital, we will stay human. But it is our chance and our duty to actually take advantage of that moment where we are bilingual right now and borrow from these systems and make sense so that the next generation com coming uh, can actually learn those words that we have forged from the print world and don't forget about what they mean. Um, so it is our duty. <laughs>